Aaron Rodgers looking for Devontae Adams. He's got it. DJ Moore has a pass to the end zone. Jonathan Taylor. Touchdown. Pass is caught. Diggs. Touchdown. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Road of His Overtime and Road of His Radio. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Overtime Ireland. And once again, joined by Sean Siegel of RoadofHis.com. Sean, we are into the Saturday edition third show of the week. It's hard to believe at this point we are, you know, we're motoring <laughs> through February. We're starting to to advance at a, a rapid rate. And I joke about this when the, you know, week 18 finished or the fantasy playoffs ended, but it does not take long. And we haven't even hit the Super Bowl yet, which will be next week. Of course, we have the Pro Bowl this week. But uh, in terms of how quick it advances from the end of the season to the Super Bowl to the draft, you know, combine free agency in between and then you're heading on to you know draft season again it happens really rapidly the other thing that always happens in february um and pretty cool this year because of the change in the super bowl by one week uh my birthday is in february the 9th of february and it always tends to uh be the week before the super bowl so i was thinking i would get a packer super bowl the week off my birthday where i could really celebrate but obviously that didn't happen but yeah, uh, February always brings me one year older <laughs> in, in the world, I guess. But um, we are ready today, Sean, on the show to talk running backs in this upcoming draft. It's going to be fun to talk through some of the guy, some of the information in the Road of His Rookie Guide that is available now. Volume 1 is out. It is available up on roadofis.com, and it will also be linked to in the show notes of today's show. But, Sean, free week, I guess we'll say this week, no no big games to really follow through on. So what what should we do on a, a week of the Pro Bowl? Uh, I'm sure we're... <laughs> I know some people will watch, but I think I'll be giving it a pass. Time to send out some dynasty trades, right? And, and get into <laughs> one of these never-too-early best ball drafts. You got to get your fantasy football fix. And a good time to read the Road of His Rookie Guide. Perfect time. Get your board set so that you're ready for, for some of these early drafts. There's it's a lot of fun because there's no shortage of football or football contests these days. We don't have to stop playing. We do have to wait a week to see where we finish in the FFPC playoff contest. And I was just chatting a little bit with Blair, our partner in the best ball tournament this last fall. He and his group are currently ninth, I believe, in the FFPC playoff contest. And because of this sort of head-to-head battle for so many teams and so many formats that really now does come down to Joe Mixon versus Jamar Chase, I believe he has a chance to finish fourth, which would be really, really cool. Uh, Ben Gretsch and I did a team for Stealing Bananas that is in the playoff two contest, and we're currently in a a multi-way tie for 34th, but also on the Jamar Chase side of that. So if we can move up with Chase having the big game in the Super Bowl, that would be fun. So we've got some Chase teams going. We'll be rooting for that column. You and I had a lot of teams that are good and are in the top third, but probably aren't going to make quite enough noise to be in the big money. We are on the mix side of it. So I guess that if he has one of those 50 point games and then double that for the Super Bowl, we could get back in there. Obviously never completely giving up but again mixing someone who <laughs> does have us covered on a variety of the teams ahead of us there what are your thoughts what's your recommendation for the best thing to do pro bowl week are you going to be watching the pro bowl i don't know i think you had it perfectly there sean it was uh get yourself the the rookie gate if you haven't already got it and uh enjoy it but um no I, it's it's always so, sometimes uh having a the week where there's a kind of peace and tranquility where you don't have to watch the games and keep up with all the action. I think that can be a nice breather. But the other part of it is, unfortunately, after the Super Bowl, we do have that extended period without games. So some people probably by the time, uh, you know, Pro Bowl comes around will watch in, but I'm I'm not going to watch into it. I'm probably going to try and spend the time uh, with with my family. <laughs> it's probably the best way to do it. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a few new series Um, i'm always looking for you know new shows to to go and watch and funnily enough we talked about uh, ted lasso a number of times in the show sean i've i've gone back already i'm uh i'm most of the way through season one so maybe getting binge watching through season two again uh, is the way to go i think um sometimes that can be good and it's interesting then sometimes when you go back and watch those shows you see different character traits because they develop maybe in the second season but you can see them 
already starting to process in season one and so on. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll be trying to to find some more content to, to binge watch. I guess will be what'll happen. You did touch on it. We were going to flip it to later in the show, but you mentioned the way too early basketball tournament. Um, Alex did send us in a question on Twitter. Alex Levy at I am Alex FF looking to get our thoughts on the way too early basketball tournament, Sean, because of the timing of the question and when we're recording this show uh you and um, ben did talk about it on stadium bananas on the friday edition so rather than i know we do have crossover between the audiences i i didn't want to dive into it in today's show but we will be talking about it i'm sure in the upcoming weeks as well from our side but what i would say is head back listen to stealing bananas alex on that one uh, if you haven't already and you'll be able to to dive in and get some thoughts but Always an interesting question that I think we can leave with listeners. And we're talking about the rookies now, but his question on it was, how do we find values at this time of the year with such volatility? But, you know, Curtis has done excellent work on the website around, you know, especially rookies and drafting them before the rookie drafts or drafting them before the NFL drafts and the value that you can get in the kind of jump and position of ADP from those guys. So there, there's obviously challenges and you're going to, you know, pick guys who I know last year, um, Zachary Kruger won't mind me saying, but he was very heavily invested in it. Probably still was able to work out as the season went on in AJ Dillon based on the thoughts that Aaron Jones was going to be free agent for the Packers and leave the Packers. At the minute, we obviously have similar situations with Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers. If you were drafting a couple, you know, a week ago and you drafted somebody like, for example, Tom Brady, who's now retired, things can happen very quickly. So there is volatility, but there's also edges to be had. So um, there's lots of options for that. But Sean, I think we'll save that actual question for us to dive into in more detail, maybe for a week or two down the line. But uh, Alex and anyone interested in some of those early draft strategies or, or thinking ahead, I think uh, listen in with Ben and Sean's Friday edition of Stealing Bananas. But Sean, we are going to look into the running backs on today's show. So I'll let you um take the floor as to as to which way you want to push us here in the the first half of the show so i've got a couple of articles here in the rookie guide looking at running backs from some slightly different angles than what you're going to see a lot of places and one of my favorite metrics for the running back position is one that dave caven has put together over the last several years and keeps us up to date on which is the breakaway rush score and he's looking at a combination of 15 plus 20 plus and 40 plus yard runs and one of the things that he's found with the score here is that it's more predictive of nfl fantasy scoring than something like the speed score right and we know how big a role speed score plays in terms of how people tend to think about these running backs how big are they how fast are they you know how does that compare when we're looking at this size speed combination now one of the things I would just mention for myself is that I'm mostly looking purely in terms of the athleticism, because one of the things that we know is there are running backs of different sizes that have different profiles that will score fantasy points. And one of the things is that the big profile uh, can be the most overvalued. And so when we're looking at how do you beat drafts and how do you execute zero running back? Well, when you have someone like a Rashad Penny who fits some of these elements and is discounted because he's had a hard time staying healthy then you definitely take that discount but we're not you know wiping away all of the smaller guys just because they are smaller some of those players are fantastic from the receiving perspective and getting those receptions is really the key to dominating your fantasy league and i also shouldn't say that just because we love this breakaway rush score that the actual speed for the guys doesn't matter right i'm I'm looking almost exclusively at players who run below four or five. And if they don't, I definitely want them to have a 90th, 90th or 95th percentile agility score to help demonstrate that athleticism. You really do need to be a running back at the NFL level. If anything, it's the most athletic based position that we see there in the NFL. You just have to be so fast and so quick in order to beat these NFL defenders that are so big and so athletic themselves. Having said that, just like what we were talking about for the wide receiver position, you have to be able to play football and guys who can break those big runs on the field are the ones who tend to translate the best to the NFL. Now, one of the things here that was kind of interesting is that Najee Harris, despite the fantastic overall production last year year in college 
didn't have these breakaway rush scores, which was especially surprising when you consider the kinds of defenses that they faced and the blocking that he got to play with. And so that was a big red flag in terms of what his efficiency was going to be like. And this was kind of a an interesting situation, I think, with Harris, where we were both right on the strengths that he was going to bring in terms of this amazing workload, his expected points numbers there at the top of the NFL, but also right in terms of what the efficiency was going to look like. He underperformed his expected points by multiple points per game, which really then takes him down into this category where he's a very viable player, especially in the second round. But as time moves along and he moves into that first round, he's going to have to change what he does and he's going to have to be able to break some of these runs in order to be someone who becomes a viable fantasy player at those prices. So who breaks off the big runs? We look at these guys from 2014 to 2021 that Dave has put together And one of my favorite guys, not necessarily from 2021, but from a couple of years ago, and he was one of the players who factored very heavily into the analysis that I did on Jonathan Taylor for last season and what that career arc was going to be. But the number one guy in terms of breakaway rush score and with a breakaway rush score that just blows away everybody else in the competition. I don't think it's going to be a big surprise that that was Melvin Gordon, right? At one point I wrote an article asking as Melvin Gordon was entering the NFL, would he be the next Barry Sanders? Obviously not that, but he was very good. And I think sometimes we can actually lose track of how good Melvin Gordon was in part because at the very end there with the chargers, he had Austin Eckler carving away some production. Yeah. And technically still is. (laughs) He's technically still good. He is. Yeah. I remember if you, I think it was maybe at the, I don't know if it was last year or um, this past season, but I remember I titled the show The Ghost of Melvin Garden. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the episode was about, but I'm sure it wasn't as complimentary as it possibly should have been um, heading into this season. Well, Melvin Gordon now, too, uh, one of the most interesting guys in terms of where his free agent landing spot will be. It's not impossible that he would actually bounce back and be a pretty compelling force here in 2022, but he tops the list, Another some other names on there, and he tops the list with a 210, right? And to put that in context, most of the guys, most of the stars are in this 100 to 130 range. We have Kareem Hunt at 128. We have Devin Singletary at 126, again, sort of foreshadowing this better than tested performance that he has put up at the NFL level as well. Saquon Barkley, 119. You have James Conner and Jonathan Taylor at 115. Dalvin Cook, 106. Aaron Jones, 106. So these are the big names from the last seven, eight seasons. And then, Colin, we get into the group of players who really jump out in these marks this year. Now, we don't have the depth at the running back position in 2022 that we've had some seasons, but we do have some interesting guys. And the top name on the list is Kennedy Brooks. And he's a little bit of a controversial figure there because of Oklahoma's offense and the soft boxes that he has faced. But he comes in there with a 104. It'll be interesting to see where he goes in the NFL draft. Someone who put up the numbers that he put up, even if there are some scouting concerns, but when you put those up, for a school like Oklahoma with that type of high profile nature. It's a little surprising actually to to know just how low he's expected to go in drafts. We'll see if that actually does happen. But then on the opposite side, the name that jumps out to me and is disappointing, sort of this year's Najee Harris from the perspective of someone that otherwise we might be very excited about, and that's Kyron Williams for Notre Dame down there at 48. Now, he also is someone who is not projected to go particularly high, which is disappointing because you watch him, he's got that elite cutting ability that we often look at with backs like a LaShawn McCoy or a Devin Singletary. He's got the receiving element that we'll talk about in a second. So those are a couple of guys sort of on two sides of the spectrum with this breakaway rush score. Obviously, you'll want to check out the guide, find out where Brees Hall, Isaiah Spiller, Kenneth Walker land. Those are really the big names. You know, Have they demonstrated the breakaway ability that we're looking for at the NFL level? And Colin, again, I, I'm excited about this because these guys, I think, are 
not exactly sleepers. They're going to be expensive. We've seen them already go early in early best ball drafts. We know that second round running backs are going to, in many cases, go ahead of first round wide receivers. When you're talking about translating the reality draft to rookie drafts, but when we're comparing these guys to sort of that Josh Jacobs, David Montgomery kind of tier, sort of looking at players who might be the beginning of the running back dead zone. I think that some of these rookies are going to be pretty interesting in terms of how some of their metrics project them to the NFL. Yeah, no, I think so as well. And I think again, going back to Alex's kind of question that he came in with, there is risk in that, like, you know, some of these guys are possibly going to test worse at the combine and then th- or maybe at their pro days and things go down the way but at the same time they can there's there's the opportunity for that to go up as well so if you're drafting at this early point while sean you mentioned there they might be expensive they they still may be at a couple of rounds discount if you're drafting at this time off at all but the other thing that i think is great with a number of these pieces you know you mentioned with the work we talked about with travis's on thursday show but in this piece with Dave's as well, and it's kind of throughout the entire guide, is obviously we have the issue with the pandemic, with players potentially sitting out games with that, missing games with COVID, uh, also injuries and things like that there, maybe players declaring early and so on. So the work again is to try and give it, you know, as as clear a context as possible and, and kind of set players off at an equal footing. So again, Dave has done this, kind of trying to balance it out as if they have had a four-year career at college, you know, at 12 games per season. So again, easier to compare the metrics across the board, but more grit work there by Dave. And Sean, you teased it a minute ago. We'll be talking a little bit more about maybe some sleepers or guys under the radar and maybe what their pass catching ability is as well. We'll do that right after the break. Sean, I obviously love reading your work when it comes to running backs and trying to find edges there, but, you know, I have to say... (laughs) probably at the uh, we'll have to say you know zero rb teammate i guess we'll say for the the zero rb watch uh, during the season that is blair andrews one of our favorite guys to talk about obviously as well um one of the co-hosts off the road of his report and season but w- when you see blair particularly when it's about pass catch and running backs and trying to find sleepers it's it's always fun to read through those so he's looking at studs and sleepers and how to use running back production you know to, to, to evaluate these players and making the combination of receiving kind of and uh, rushing percentages to see how we figure things out. But, um, you know, he talks about athletic testing for running backs and, and it's been important. But when we're looking at it here at this point ahead of the combine, is there any ways that we should be factoring that in when we maybe don't have 100% solid numbers at, the, at this point of the process? Yeah, and that's to look at these breakaway rush scores and some of the other (laughs) metrics to get a sense of how fast does the person play. Yeah. And especially at running back, you know, I want them to also test very well, but the play speed is going to be incredibly important. So we're looking at kind of both parts of that and trying to find these guys that fall through the cracks. Another way that we can look for these guys that fall through the cracks is just see, you know, who was productive overall and then who is catching these passes, right? And so Blair for several years has been looking at this combination of metrics where he's talking about guys who have 100 scrimmage yards per game and a 10% share of their team's receiving yardage. And that gives you a chance to go through and find some sleepers so we have Rashad White from Arizona State for example 127 scrimmage yards and 21 percent of his team's receiving share the interesting thing here is that obviously he comes in doesn't have a big season as a transfer in the pandemic year but then blows up in 2021 he's a big back likely to test decently well And then you look at all of these receiving numbers and you think, okay, well, he could be someone who is a sleeper for me. Blair also then gives us a variety of guys who could be sort of smaller receiving backs. And we talk about potential profile three backs, potential guys who could come in and give you some Darren Sproles type of production, uh, bring you some Danny Woodhead type of production. We know those guys who completely come through and give you top 10 numbers 
with that type of profile are rare, but they're also inexpensive, especially the first time that they do it. And every once in a while, you have one of these players emerge as an Austin Eckler. And then you're not just talking about a top 10 guy, but someone who is actually legitimately a top five pick in drafts. We want to be on these players early when they're very, very inexpensive. So Blair has really four good options there. And one of them, and the reason why I, I kind of wanted to structure it this way, because I do think it's interesting, is to see sort of the pluses and minuses for some of the players. And Kyron Williams, the guy we just talked about in the last segment, as struggling in the breakaway rush, he pops here in this analysis with 113 scrimmage yards per game and 12% receiving share. And we know he was also very good in 2020. It was actually one of these situations where he disappointed a little bit in 2021 by not really emerging more as a straight runner, you know, 40 more receptions. And so you're looking at a guy who, you know, could be that James White type of player maybe not a game breaker you know we don't look for james white to take the ball and go 70 yards for the touchdown but if you're talking about someone who could be the security blanket for a good quarterback in a super bowl comeback for example maybe kyron williams is that down the road so we, we want to again always be looking at the different elements of a player's profile and when someone pops at the elite end of particular metrics that we do know are important to us, maybe that counteracts some of the weaknesses, right? If you have a strength that is playable, especially when it translates into fantasy points, that's something that's always going to raise some eyebrows and make you look at, well, what is the price then? Because if Williams ends up going, you know, in the fourth, fifth, sixth, you know, if he's a day, like a solid middle to late day three back, it's going to be a lot harder to get that early production. But at the same time, not impossible. I mean, obviously Aaron Jones uh, and, and many other players have come out of that range. Now Jones tested very well in terms of the explosiveness numbers, tested very well in terms of agility, in terms of leaping. And so then you have guys coming after him with very similar profiles. It's interesting to see two players with almost identical profiles to each other and to him in terms of Clyde edwards alaire and Eno Benjamin, one going in the first round, the other going at the very tail end of the draft, having different expectations as a result, but maybe from a fairness perspective, the actual reasonable outcome a lot closer to the middle. And so, you know, we're looking at where are the prices, where could the value be? One of the things that I am in the process of putting together is a projection of where all of the running backs will go in terms of free agency in the draft and and this obviously isn't meant to be accurate i'm going to miss on most of the draft picks because they could go to any one of almost 32 teams there are probably you know four or five teams where there's zero chance that they would take it back and yet all the time we see the teams that actually need backs don't end up getting them that was one of the frustrating things with miami last season and then backs who already have their players they're like you just you drafted another one right you used this important draft capital at a position the number one is not the most important position and number two where you already had someone and so what actually happens is going to thwart these projections but by going through that exercise i get a sense of you know what teams are likely to make a move in free agency what teams are more likely to make a move in the draft and what teams might end up in a little bit of trouble on both sides or might need to use both their picks and their money in different ways with James Conner and Chase Edmonds as free agents, you know, Benjamin, someone who actually is a pretty interesting pick early on from this perspective of where might we find a value? Where might we find a guy who is the next mega sleeper who comes through and wins you big tournaments in 2022? Now, you know, is it likely that any specific guy that I mentioned like that is going to be the person? Uh, perhaps not, but we do want to have him on our radar and then column one other thing just to kind of wrap this up and, and give us a sense of of context for where some of these players are perhaps going to be what the prices are you know where you might feel comfortable drafting them and being excited or being disappointed about the current price we've, we've had this question from alex who is a great supporter of the show and we really appreciate the things that that he has done in the listener leagues and and all of that kind of thing so i did want to mention 
this first draft that Blair and I are doing give you a feel for where some of these guys are going. Brees Hall, the 506, right? And if he is the first back off the board, if he goes in the first half of the second round to a team that needs a back, 506 is going to end up looking very, very cheap. Now, at the same time, one of the reasons why I said this looks to me like a zero RB season, at least early, is that you get out of the fourth round and suddenly, you know, the wide receivers are more or less gone when we're talking about instant impact. And yet the 506, you know, Elijah Mitchell goes at 505. We probably expect him to be a key part of the 49ers attack next season. We know that that position even more than some other running back slots around the NFL does tend to see some turnover. Even when guys flash, they will find someone else where the backs will get injured. But Mitchell at, at the 505 has to be someone you're excited about. <laughs> Ezekiel Elliott, sort of one of our whipping boys, goes at the 503. And so you may even be thinking, well, I don't like Elliott, but at the 503, that's a much better value than some rookie that I don't know anything about. So we want to keep that in, in context too. Leonard Fournette, the 511. And I don't think you and I are going to exactly ever be on the Fournette train. But when you're talking about that spot for someone who is probably going to go in free agency to a team that wants to use him as both a runner and a pass catcher. I mean, it's not going to be the Tom Brady dump off extraordinaire situation, but he could have a lot of receptions again. So we're talking about round five in these backs, just because Hall is going there doesn't mean he's going to be an extraordinary value relative to the other backs, but you can kind of see how that element of the draft is playing out. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And even like, you know, people might have been factoring in maybe Fournette goes back to the Buccaneers. Obviously, that, that's less likely probably now that Brady is not going to be there. But then it's again, it's that playing that game of where he lands in free agency. So, yeah, I think there's going to be interesting. I did say there that I'm, you know, <laughs> the 503 for Elliott is much better than the 105. Um, it, it is a better value <laughs> if we're heading into this season. But I, I think, um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch that as we move forward. Again, the rookie guide is available up on the Rotoviz website that is rotoviz.com head on over and check it out the, the link will also be in today's show description Sean I'm going to hit you with two hard hitting questions before we finish up today's show just checking which team name would you vote for the Washington football team and leave it at that or the Washington commanders which team would you which would you rather well I mean are we are we trapped in some old Russell Crowe film i mean the russians this are is, coming <laughs> it, this is like master and commander there has to be a submarine or, or submarine other end of the universe or you mentioned that uh, column and i hadn't really been thinking about that other than it maybe doesn't do what they're hoping for and the contrast with when i was very very little right they have the original usfl and you've got the, the showboats and the gamblers and the bandits and the blitz. And I mean, one of the best things about the USFL when you're a little kid is that these team names are awesome. And I don't know. I mean, Washington would have been better if they had tried to find a USFL team name, I think. Yeah, we could have. The Washington Blitz would have actually been would have been interesting. Um, yeah, but uh, the other note on that is I did see Curtis Patrick had posted on Twitter that the Commanders is still a better team name than the Browns, and we we know Curtis <laughs> being a Cleveland fan. Um, so maybe he wants to if they can trade franchise names, maybe. But uh, the other question, uh, my brother is a a diehard Patriots fan, and Patriots fans, I know Sean again, you're it's it's luckily for you, sometimes you're immune from this stuff. You don't see it on Twitter. But the Patriots fans did not take it too well this week when Tom Brady didn't mention them in his retirement statement. Should should he have uh, mentioned them in that retirement statement or or do you think this pettiness level is okay? It it just adds to the drama, right? It I, I don't think that anybody with the Patriots would have necessarily been surprised by this this is you know you, you take the good and the bad with these elite competitors and you know we're not spiking tablets and refusing to shake hands on the handful of times that we lose you know it, you have the the kind of michael jordan elements i was going to say it's like the uh the meme from um the last dance where michael jordan says and i took that personally it feels <laughs> it feels like that's what's happened here 
Well, I don't know how I got into it, but over the last couple of weeks, I've been watching some some content on YouTube about some of these old NBA teams. And I haven't, I mean, the NBA is awesome, but I haven't been personally that interested in a long time. I'm more of a, a college basketball fan, sort of a, an NFL fan on the football side and, and college uh, on the basketball side. I got my Kansas Jayhawks here growing up in Kansas City, just you know, 45 minutes down the road from Lawrence. Uh, but again, when I was a little kid, I had a chance to see Isaiah Thomas play in person. And he was the most extraordinary ball handler, I think, that the NBA has seen certainly in a long time. And there, there are you know, five or six other guys with the history of the league who, who are similar, but his combination of ball handling and competitiveness you know, leading the Pistons and the bad boys. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, they, they get all of the criticism for walking off before the game ends, uh, even though that, you know, Larry Bird and, and the Celtics did that to them and showed the same level of poor sportsmanship. And, you know, Larry Bird probably maybe not 50, 50, but like 40, 60 responsible for those situations with Bill Lane beer that tends to all be put on Lane beer, but so you, you have these situations with the elite competitors. You've got Larry Burden company walking off, Isaiah Thomason company walking off, uh, Michael Jordan then being the greatest player of all time. And I don't, I mean, th there's just really no controversy about that. I mean, he's the greatest basketball player of all time by a pretty wide margin. And yet you know, there are things that come out. I mean, even his, his teammates on those teams, I mean, almost none of them seem to like him at all. <laughs> And so you, you you have a little bit of that, I think, here with Tom Brady and with the Bill Belichick kind of thing. It, it was more or less inevitable that there were going to be some hard feelings in terms of who gets credit, some hard feelings in terms of just when people are definitely more worried about winning than friendships, that's what's going to be the emphasis. And so when you have a guy retire, you have a situation where Tom Brady is done. It's still more about winning for himself than it is winning for the team or the fans. And so when it's all about you, that's what your retirement is, is also going to be about. When you when you hang it up and you give those you know, final talks, everything is going to be thinly veiled, me, me, me. So I don't, I don't think that anything that comes off poorly to the Patriots or the Patriots fans necessarily a surprise it's, it's unfortunate in its own way i mean you would have loved for larry bird isaiah thomas michael jordan all to show you know perhaps just a tiny bit more sportsmanship at the key moments you would like that on the handful of occasions that tom brady actually loses an nfl game to show some sportsmanship to the other team and the other quarterbacks but again that, that's part of what makes all of those guys so interesting so great and such good stories. And I, I know that part of this is just that, you know, I, I don't want to be 10, 15 years down the line. And one of the reasons why, you know, I was saying it, it's okay for the Chiefs to lose this game. We want to share it around a little bit. You know, it's just that I don't want the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes to be villains in the same light that the New England Patriots and Tom Brady were. I don't want to be 10, 15 years down the road. And for Patrick Mahomes to be the villain, it's hard for me to see Tom Brady in a different line. I even mentioned on the previous show, I would have loved for him to play the villain role for another five, six, 10 years. It would have been cool to see him playing into his fifties. Uh, but perhaps as we move along, we can get back away from that. And I do think that a, a few years down the road, you know, he'll be more excited about the Patriots. He'll be more excited about Bill Belichick. Mend some of those fences as history gives us a little bit of time, I think everybody will be in a situation where they can feel pretty good about this. Because again, I mean, your team won a bunch of Super Bowls. You're the greatest postseason quarterback ever. And in the long run, that can't help but be anything but positive. Yeah. Uh, you know, these bridges will be mended. Um, it does seem, you know, there, there definitely was some reasons for it. I had seen as well that the picture that he posted, I think it was on Instagram, was the picture from when the Buccaneers beat the Patriots in Gillette Stadium last year. So there obviously is some kind of pointed uh, jabs, I guess, happening. But, you know, we've seen much worse situations than a, a retirement statement. We've seen Brett Favre and the Packers. Favre ends up, you know, going to the Vikings, and that took years and years for that to kind of simmer down we've seen him and rogers have very tough relationships it, it does happen in sports where things 
you know, do go their separate ways and often not in the most pleasant manner. But yeah, a couple of years down the line, this will all be sewn over. We'll be seeing Tom Brady paraded around uh, Gillette Stadium, I'm sure. Uh, you mentioned as well, Sean, the um, some of the things about the competitive nature of these guys. That's just going to be part of it. But you mentioned you want to see Brady playing the villain. You also started off the story of the Washington Commanders about a Russell Crowe film. So maybe the key is to get Tom Brady playing a villain and a Russell Crowe film, and then we'll be we'll be all good. But yeah. Um, finishing up today's show and that way as always as a loyal podcast listener as well you can get yourself that 10 percent discount to a road of his nfl pass with the code rb radio 2022 at checkout of course the link to the rookie guide is in today's show description as well as is the link to the road of his youtube channel so hit subscribe on that if you have a moment drop us a written interview on your favorite podcast app we do appreciate all the support that comes from those it's great to interact with the community and get those questions and we will be trying to get more and more listener questions over the next couple of weeks as there will be obviously no nfl games we'll be trying to fill them in with some strategy questions some off-season questions that you might want to hear our thoughts on and so we will be having those over the coming weeks you can send them to me on twitter at overtime ireland or email them over at rotobizradio at gmail.com that is going to bring us to the end of today's episode thank you for tuning in to today's show my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at overtime ireland and of course you can check out sean's work up on rotoviz.com and until we're back next week with another show have a good one thank you for listening to overtime on rotoviz radio please rate and review the rotoviz radio podcast on itunes or your favorite podcast app you can contact us via email at rotovizradio at gmail.com follow us on twitter at rotoviz radio and remember, you can always support the pod by subscribing to Rotoviz with a discount through the Rotoviz Radio homepage, rotoviz.com forward slash podcast.